bill being uh, passed through its remaining stages through the House this afternoon. I call Brett Hudson. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise to continue national support uh, for this bill, but not entirely without reservations. We certainly do agree. We certainly do agree that there is a role for uh, the government, uh, through the, the State Services Commissioner, to ensure that uh, the salaries of uh, public sector CEOs are not disproportionate uh, to the value of the role, and indeed in the minds, particularly of the public. Everything we do and say here is scrutinised by the public, should they choose. And uh, the nature of the services government provides and the people that provide them, including their employment terms, conditions and salaries, are also able to be judged by the public, and the public will do so. So we do acknowledge and accept that there is a, a role. We also fundamentally view that it is important that the government has the right person in the role of CE for any Crown entity, and in fact, any government agency. And there could be some concern then, Madam Chair, that if the measures that, it, that will be enacted when this bill does pass, and it certainly appears that it, it has to now, that, um, that we could end up with a certain situations where a preference or weighting is given to certain criteria that could result in something other than the very best or the best person uh, for the job uh, uh, being prepared to take it. Uh, Madam Speaker, we, we don't prejudge that the best person for a, a Crown Entity CE role is someone from outside of the, currently outside of the public sector. Uh, and we certainly don't wish to prevent someone inside the public sector who is the right person for the job getting that job. So we don't want to create a race for the, the, the top in the sense that the public sector would be competing with the very highest paid private sector CEs to somehow claim that they can only be the source of the right skills for that Crown entity and therefore ratcheting up salaries unnecessarily or needlessly. Um, but we do think that there should be, it should be uh, worked in a way and operated in a way that we do get the right person for the job. And if the right person for the job happens to be for someone from outside the public sector currently, then we should make sure that, uh, that, that the, the, the terms and conditions of the employment doesn't pre pre present a barrier to that right person seeking or taking the role. Similarly, if the person is within the public sector, we shouldn't use these mechanisms as some sort of an artificial ceiling on their, the recognition of their value in taking up the role. So likewise, if, we, if, if the per right person is someone in the public sector uh, and the role has a value uh, in contrast to the private sector, we shouldn't use this as a mechanism to suppress uh, the potential remuneration for that uh, public, current public sector uh, individual. And the way the bill has still has exited the committee stage has certain elements in it that could lead to that. We made points that, uh, for instance, the, the criteria that are set out, such as you know, government expectations, such as public expectations, but also the commercial realities or the market realities and market uh, uh, similarities, are each elements that the Commissioner will weigh up or can give regard to, can give regard to, as they assess giving their consent or not to the terms and conditions or the deal put in front of them. But there is no, there is no uh, sense of a weighting. There is no sense of quantifying or qualifying how each of them will be measured against the other, because they are corresponding views in many ways, other, uh, each two sides of an argument. So at the moment that the bill passes, uh, the State's Commission, the State Services Commission can give a guard to all these factors, but not only do we not know what factors will get greater weighting in any set of circumstances, but neither do the boards for those entities. And to that degree, we're all sort of shooting in the dark. And that's, I think, unnecessary. The outcome could be unfortunate, but it's actually not necessary. The House could have taken the opportunity to have made amendments to that. Uh, and I think when we consider, and we weren't, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to voice this consideration yesterday, but when we consider the actual process, it has even greater relevance. Because the process, as we set out in this legislation, is that first the board will negotiate with the 
current CE or prospective CE, they will reach agreement. They will have a deal in principle. And it is only then that the board goes off to the State Services Commissioner and says, will you agree to this? That has very real prospects that if the State Services Commissioner then says no, because the legislation doesn't require them to say I'll agree to X, Y and Z, they simply say yes or no. So if the State Service Commissioner says no, then we can potentially see what was uh, a, a, an acceptable uh, deal uh, suddenly being removed from the table and that candidate exiting. Uh, so I think the way the process is set and, and legislation could have been uh, improved further, but the weighting element, the absence of that weighting of each of the criteria is exacerbated, the issue is exacerbated because of the way the process works. Now, it's too late to amend the legislation, but what the minister responsible could do, and I, I ask him to consider doing just this, is that he can set very clear expectations on the State Services Commissioner, how he anticipates that the Commissioner will exercise his responsibilities and authority under this revised legislation. He could, for instance, ask that the State Services Commissioner communicate with the Board, at least in advance of them entering into employment discussions, how the State Services Commissioner will weight each of those criteria. That would be very helpful for the Board and I think help to ensure that the deal that is, is put on the table uh, is, is one that is not only acceptable, obviously, to the Board and the candidate, but which will be more readily uh, understood and accepted uh, by the State Services Commissioner. But equally, and I think equally importantly, particularly when we look at the process of make a deal and then present it to the Commissioner, I think that the Minister should make it clear that it is his expectation that the State Services Commissioner will make, will make themselves available during the employment negotiation process such that the Board can tell the State Services Commissioner where the negotiations are heading where potential points of contention may be. And while the State Services Commissioner would certainly not be obliged to give a definitive ruling at that point in time, could give some additional guidance during the negotiation, which would mean that once that, that, that agreement between the prospective CE and the Board is reached, it is far more likely that then the State Service Commissioner will be able to endorse it, give it their consent, and we will won't have a situation where a refusal leads to a very good candidate just throwing their arms up in a sense and walking away because the deal that had been agreed has to be renegotiated at what would then be for them the 11th hour. I actually think and the Minister can do that and I ask him to do that very thing. It doesn't undermine the bill in any way. It doesn't undermine the legislation but it uh, provides a very good working arrangement uh, in practice which would see the, the, the intent of the legislation uh, bearing out in reality the way we would all like to see. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Speaker, I'd just also make a point on, which I did raise with the Minister yesterday, uh, which is still a, a, a little concerning, at least to me, which is around the Code of Conduct. Not that the, not that the State Services Commissioner can create one for boards, but that when given the Code of Conduct is around integrity and um, behaviour uh, as board members, uh, I, I still have this concern that the legislation is saying that the State Services Commissioner can create codes. So we still have the situation where the Commissioner could create multiple codes, many, many different codes. And if a, a person is a member of more than one of our boards, more than one of the boards of Crown Entities, they could end up having to operate under multiple codes of conduct. And I think again, the Minister could uh, very clearly set out an expectation to the State Services Commissioner that wherever possible there should be one code of conduct for the matter, uh, that counts for integrity and the behaviour of those board members and only in situations where it is absolutely necessary, possibly because of uh, some interaction, as the Minister pointed out yesterday, with a particular professional code of conduct related to the the, the business or the work of the Crown entity, uh, but that in, in, unless it is absolutely necessary, there should, the, the goal should be one code of conduct that applies across boards and across, obviously, board members. Uh, so the, the legislation is, is achieving a good purpose, and we will and do support it. We 
have some regrets that there wasn't quite panel beated into the sort of shape that we think would have added a bit extra value, but all is not lost. All is not lost. Through expectation setting, the Minister can ensure New Zealand gets exactly what it deserves. We commend the Bill to the House. I call the Honourable Shane. E, e Turiana tēnei taringa oku, Madam Speaker.